Welcome to the Veterans Summit, Kate Dahlstedt, and thank you so much for being here. I really look forward to this because of your tremendous dedication to veterans for so many years uh, through the foundation that you had, Soldier's Heart, with your husband, and uh, Dr. Edward Tick, um, and all of the continuing service that you're giving to veterans and their families and to educating civilians, uh, non-veterans, about what the life is like for those returning home and how we can help them do better. So I'd love to start, Kate, with some information about your experience with your own father who was in World War II and as a young child and growing up with him, what your impressions were of what it meant to be called to service. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, my dad was two years through his uh, bachelor's degree uh, when he got called up. And so he had to, um, he had to serve instead of finish his, his college, but um, which he did eventually. That he was, uh, he was part of the engineer corps in Europe. Mm -hmm. And um, he always felt very grateful that he didn't have to ever pull a trigger or, or shoot, you know, shoot anyone. Or he, and he was never shot at. And he feels like in some ways that saved his spirit. It saved his soul. Right. Yeah. But he did see a lot of the destruction in, in Europe, uh, the buildings and so on, the cities that were just turned to rubble. And that was very disturbing to him. But when he, uh, when Finally, Europe was liberated. He was sent to the Philippines to then go and invade Japan. And uh, that was going to be in a combat unit and he was going to be carrying a gun and he was going to be shot at. And um, that was much more daunting for him and, and his fellow troops. But uh, as, as um, things un unfolded, it turned out that the atomic bomb was dropped before he had to go and serve that way. So he was no longer part of the occupation, I mean, of the invasion, but now he was part of the occupation. And so he still had to go to Japan and they were stationed about eight miles outside of Hiroshima and drove through it uh, frequently. So uh, when I would ask him about that, he would say, you know, well, there wasn't much to see. It was just, there was nothing, you know, it was just flattened. Yeah. And, um, and yet, it, it really impacted my dad in ways that he didn't often articulate, but he did change his major in college because he was, he was going towards uh, nuclear engineering and he swore off that completely and mm -hmm. <clears throat> changed his major. Mm -hmm. So that, that was one major impact that it had on him. But <clears throat> Um, you know, he didn't, he wasn't a guy who had a lot of buddies and friends, you know, he didn't go and play poker with the guys and stuff like that. He was kind of a homebody, but he, um, he was actually, um, kind of, uh, an introvert, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, he, he, um, he could, he could go on stage and be a character, but he had difficulty, not difficulty, but he was reluctant. And interpersonal relationships. And I don't know how much of that was impacted. By the, right. the other thing <clears throat> my dad did a lot <clears throat> was he stayed in the basement and tinkered a lot. And, you know, we talk about veterans isolating, <clears throat> right? You know, and I've often thought about that, you know, in my older years about how he kind of isolated in that way. <laughs> and, um, but I was always kind of curious about what, what's, you know, where's dad? You know, mom would be off doing something. Where's dad? So I go down in the basement and I, I, I went down there frequently when he was down there tinkering with things. And, you know, he used to, he would build things and all that because he was an engineer at heart. But, um, you know, he would have some artifacts down there in the basement and uh, in a trunk. And mm -hmm. he would take them out and show them to me, you know, different things like the, the, the canteen he had, you know, things yeah. like that. You know, little, right. But he also, you know, he had um, a Japanese rifle somehow he came upon that, probably not legally, <laughs> but um, <laughs> things like that. So he, he talked to me a little bit about it, not the horror stuff, but just his experience as a, you know, as a, a troop at that time. And so uh, 
it wasn't until just last year when he was getting close to dying that he he started he was in a memory care unit didn't remember me thought my sister was his sister was his sister um but and didn't remember my mom or anything but he did remember that he was in hiroshima after the bomb and this is a guy who never talked about it his friends probably never knew at his memorial i mentioned this and there were people there who had no idea that he yeah. had done that. He'd got, walked through Hiroshima after the bomb, you know? He just kept that inside. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, you know, it's hard to say yeah. who he would have been, you know, if, if that hadn't happened. But I know that it, I know that it, it impacted him. And when he talked to me about it when I got older and shared more, he cried. You know, he would cry and break down. And he would say, you know, it probably saved my life or it may have saved my life because I was going into combat. Right. And But right. the war ended. But then he says, but it's, it was such an evil thing. Mm -hmm. Was it worth it? You know, did we unleash something that we can't take back now? And is the world less safe? Right. It? Right. And, and it really, it really ate, ate away at him a lot. Yeah. yeah. Your, your work with veterans um, and particularly with women, can you sort of describe how that all came about? That oh. did, it, did it evolve through... Your, your work as a psychotherapist, through your knowing your husband. How did all of it come to, to you being so intimately involved and yep. uh, dedicated to this? Hmm. <clears throat> well, it's, it did start through my practice. And uh, of course, Ed started specializing in working with veterans in the early 80s. Mm -hmm. um, and it it, it, he didn't like put that out, but it just veterans started coming and word got around and that kind of thing. But, you know, some of them would be in marriages and they would want to do marriage counseling or, or their wives were like going out of their minds and wanted to help. So I would often see the wife and then sometimes mm -hmm. we would do sessions together with the husband and wife. So that's sort of the back door that I came into it with. But then we started doing um, like workshops and we would get um, vet some veterans and some non-veterans together because mm -hmm. we were really aware that there was this rift, especially around the Vietnam War. Yes. So, that, so the, the guys who went and the guys who didn't go, and there was like this big gulf in between. Mm -hmm. And so we started doing work to try to, to integrate those who maybe even were protesting the war in Vietnam with the, the Vietnam veterans. And that, that started working really well. We, we were just doing like a Saturday afternoon kind of thing. And um, a friend of ours then suggested, you maybe you want to start a nonprofit so you can work with veterans, you know, and, mm -hmm. you know, get, get grant money and then you can just do your work. Because, it, you know, after uh, Ed's book came out in 2005, yes. War and the Soul came out. Yes. And we had thought, oh, you know, it might be helpful to some vets and maybe a few therapists will read it too. And, and that. we had no idea that we would get so inundated with phone calls. And request it, still it's tremendous yeah yes yeah yes mm -hmm. and so uh we, we were kind of we, we both had private practice i was working at the college at the time and you know it was hard to manage so mm -hmm. we decided well maybe we will do that so we did and we created soldiers heart <clears throat> which we ran for 12 years and uh loved dearly um and so it that allowed us to do uh weekend retreats <laughs> and again it was mostly that <clears throat> But we always made sure that we had community witnesses mm -hmm. because so of that important. need to integrate. Yes. You know, we, we as a society, you know, spend a lot of time and energy training our troops to go off to war. But we don't do very much to help them come back. And really, as a society, we owe it to them. Yes. You know, and what we do is we expect them to come back and totally reintegrate themselves. And that's just not going to work and it's not fair. And so they really need civilians to be willing to, you know, to help them cross that bridge and to be yes. able to witness their stories and to, to take responsibility for the things that they had to do in our name. I think that's so important. Mm -hmm. That is so important because people really just don't know. I mean, I'm certainly guilty of that myself. I mean, I lived through all of these different times of war and I did not know. I mean, I also had a, a, you know, stepmother who was, you know, heavily involved in the news. But 
I didn't feel it or know it uh, because I didn't have anyone in my family who was serving. So I didn't know it from that level. I mean, my father was in the Navy for a brief period of time, right around college, but he, he you know, didn't see combat or any, anything like that. So that was um, all I knew was what I saw in the movies. And that's not real, <laughs> what you're seeing in the movies. And coming home is, uh, you know, since I have known you and Dr. Tick and um, read both of his um, books, The Warrior's Return being the most recent one, I realized that responsibility that you're talking about is really so critical and that how many people will say thank you for your service and that is just such a trite expression at this point because they really have no idea what their service was you right. know and they don't know no what they what they did in our name yeah 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 uh, well, and, and some people are not particularly proud of what they did no in no. our name yeah and which is really yeah. sad because mm -hmm. they carry that guilt on their you know on their own shoulders yeah, you know, it, it was us and our government that sent them there, whether we whether we agree with the war personally or not. Our government okay. has sent them into harm's way. And we need to take responsibility for that. And to, uh, as I said, help them return, but also take some responsibility from them. Yes. You know, let I them know that's... that you're not carrying this alone. You know, you did this in my name and in, in whatever you did you know, I'm as guilty as you are. Yeah, that is so, so moving and really powerful. And I, I wanted to ask um, particularly uh, about your role doing separate retreats or separate circles for women that were in the military where you also had other non-veteran women. And although, as you had, had have indicated, the 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 women that are non-military that are civilians have a way to escape many of the same types of things that the women veterans are experiencing um particularly what comes to mind is sexual assault mm -hmm. sexual harassment mm -hmm. okay. there are laws that can uh you can uh report at your work but there are things that those do not translate into the military because the military has their own set of rules, justice, yeah. law, mm -hmm. and it's insulated right there. So you described in um, this chapter that I read that you gave me that the civilian women were in tears hearing what the veteran women had gone through. And one of the most interesting parts and I, I, I want to mention something that I had heard which so echoes what you say. There was a new recruit, um, she was in the Air Force and she was uh, assaulted by a higher ranking officer almost immediately upon coming into her service. She was horrified, she didn't know what to do and one of the things that was so astonishing to her is that several of the other women said, oh, so I guess you got, you know, assaulted. They had all been assaulted. But there wasn't a sense of, of bonding. Like you talk about the men bond and there's this brotherhood, but not with the women. And she said that it took her years she did not get support from the women because of this, which I, I'm going to ask you to describe this sort of competitive mm -hmm. uh, suck it up. You've, you know, mm -hmm. you have to do twice as much, you know, you can't show any weakness. And she literally lived with this for seven years till she was at the point of suicide and all of her behavior during that seven years she was showing symptoms, she was drinking, she was doing all, acting out in all these ways. Mm -hmm. And it was a man, it was a male officer who noticed this about her and said, something is happening, something happened to you. And he called her into his office, but he said, leave the door open, you can stand over there, 
And if you get uncomfortable at any time, please let me know. But he took her through this process of being able to, to report where she could not report. And she was at the point of suicide. Literally, yeah. she had the gun to her head and she had the trigger cocked. Yeah. And her husband was in the other room and he came running in and knocked the gun out of her hand. So she had lived with this for all this time because nobody gave her the, 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 nobody noticed. And the ones that knew that were actually told could risk their stature or anything. So I'd love for you to address that because I think that's particularly important that you would think the women would be able to bond like the men bond, but they right. don't. From well, what there's a, you're yeah, saying. There's a couple yeah. of reasons, I think. Um, yeah. First of all, there's so many more men than there are women. Of that course, it's yes. possible to be, you know, one of five women on a base of 500. Exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, easily. So yeah. um, oftentimes they're not even anywhere near each other. Right. Uh, you know, and a base is almost like a small city sometimes, a small town. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not like they were showering together or, you know, rooming together or those kinds of things. No, they're isolated from each they're other. They're very isolated yeah. from one another, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, not always, but, but right. frequently. Um, and as you said, uh, in the military, a, a woman really has to work twice as hard to prove herself. She may be doing just as well as the men, but she's not going to get the same promotions and so on unless she does better than the men. Right. And you, yes, you cannot show any vulnerability in the military. It's really that very strong male man's world, you know, mm -hmm. and um, some emotions are not allowed. And so for a woman to be at all vulnerable with another woman, you would think would be very helpful, but in that environment, that competitive environment, it would not be uncommon for someone to share a confidence and then have that turned around and maybe exposed or whatever, and um, merely because of the competition between the two. So mm. other women were not seen as, as confidants, they were seen as, as the, the competition. Yeah. Yeah, and, and they did some. You know, they did betray. They would betray each other and everything else to 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 make their way into the. You know, to keep their own status. Mm -hmm. And it's a very sad, you know, reality, because especially because you know that brotherhood, as we've said. I mean, that is a lifesaver for people in the war zone. Yeah. You know, you have to know that somebody has your back. Mm -hmm. And as I put in the in the chapter, there, you know, many cases I've heard of instances where military women were sexually abused by an officer and had to the next day go back out and work alongside that person. And they had no confidence that that person had their back and that that person really wasn't thinking that they might just do away with her because she might mm -hmm. squeal. So mm -hmm. not only are they afraid of the enemy, you know, they can get to a point where they're also afraid of their fellow combatants mm. don't know who to trust so there there they are in their horrible situation with absolutely nobody that they feel like they can rely on except themselves and that you know that in itself um could create if that if that was a woman's only experience you know right. <laughs> that yeah. would be enough but then to have uh well being you know look, passed over for promotions and all that stuff which is very angering and, and then but then if you do get a promotion you know, well, it's who, who did you sleep with? Mm -hmm. you slept with the right person to get that promotion instead of mm -hmm. you got mm -hmm. that in your own right. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and then, of course, if a woman, if a girl, or a woman, a troop, um, if she agrees to have a sexual relationship with a, with a male troop, well, then she becomes, she's labeled, you know, a slut, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And if she doesn't, if she refuses, well, then she must be a dyke. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with you? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Or, um, or a bitch. So those are the three that I've heard over and over through all the years I worked I, from women, different women from different branches of the service, you know, all over the world. And they all say that those are the three things, you know, you're either, you know, you're either a, a, a bitch or a, or, a, or a dyke or, you know, you're a whore. And it's unbelievable. You can't be just a person in your own right. 
Yeah, and that that's something that I think is so interesting and, I mean, so complex, is that it's like a microcosm of our society with this, you know, predominance of male, uh, uh, alpha male mentality, really, um, right. with a very small percentage of women. But it is, it, it's like, how do we ever turn this around so that women are seen as you know what you have you better have their back because guess what they've got yours and you know if you uh, are traumatizing them so that they are now compromised in their yes. ability to serve yes. you are risking your life that's right it has an impact on you and i i spoke to um one of the uh, the um, people who had written, you know, regulations and harassment uh, education tools and, you know, I, I said, you know, this is not just a question of telling people what is right or appropriate or wrong. I said, they need to know your life can be in jeopardy for what you have just done. To someone else it has to be personal mm -hmm. there has to be a consequence that means something to them and if they think that it's going to be something that is not going to be reported they don't really recognize the psychological trauma that actually endangers their life and affects readiness mm -hmm. and that i think is something that really should be made known is mm -hmm. that the effect of trauma is so long lasting and it is so profound, you know, and I said, is trauma a part of this educational process? Do they know how it works in mm -hmm. your body and in your whole mm -hmm. nervous system? Do they really get what that does to somebody? I you don't know? think they do. I don't think they do either. I don't, I don't experience the military talking about, uh, those kinds of things because they don't, A, they don't want to, you know, if you tell somebody that this might be their response, then that's their response. You know, they don't want to like uh, set it up that way. But um, mm, interesting. Yeah. But they, I think their mentality is, oh no, we, we are the biggest and we are the best and nothing bothers us, mm -hmm. you know, and it won't mm -hmm. bother you. You can go out and kill and, you know, be shot at and all that stuff and have your buddies die. And, but you're tough and it won't bother you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, they don't want to talk about, you know, how it might impact people. So that that happens af after you get home and you're broken. You know, yes, they can talk to you about that. But. Right, but when you think that these that these women, you know, their desire to serve, and what that in and of itself, uh, to to give your life for your country, but then to be having this on top of it, so that you don't know where you are able to turn to be safe. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of trauma and that chronic, that um, just constant trauma and stress, there is no moment in which you're able to not be hypervigilant. Right. And, and that is just extraordinary, the, the, the uh, uh, impact that that would have. And so that makes me think there, that their uh, dedication is even more extraordinary mm -hmm. than so many people cool. realize. Yes, I think that is really true. I mean, it takes it takes a special person to to decide to enlist in the military to begin with. You Absolutely. Know? And and a lot of these women, especially the younger women, mm -hmm. you know, seeing that with you know Iraq and Afghanistan vets, that um, you know these young women grew up in a different era than we did, and right. Um, right. and actually, you know, many. Uh, lesbian women do go into the military it's, you know that's not a fallacy but because because they you know they have that sort of more tough you know I, mm -hmm. i'm gonna you know do it i'm gonna prove myself you know all those things um but we don't uh we just don't do enough of the education and even prepare i don't even know that we prepare women for the appropriate response to mm -hmm. a sexual assault. 
Minerva. Well, the, from what I understand, they are given, this is how you handle it. This is who you call. This is where you can go. This is yeah. what you can do. Right. And um, as I said to um, Scott Jansen when I was interviewing him for this summit, I said, well, what about um, profiling perpetrators? Instead of let's handle it after the fact, what about is there any kind of study that lets you know that or profiling or anything that's done when people are coming into the military that they have this kind of uh, prevalence or pre predilection or whatever the word is because I was told that you're going to see something like this come up, you know, eighth, ninth, tenth grade. There'll be some indication that this person may have this kind of oh. uh, of ability. But um, I was told um, by um, another individual who um, is a victim's advocate that it's just almost impossible to be able to profile this number of people. Mm -hmm. But the question is, is there a motivation? to do that because what you really want them to do is be trained for war and that's what you're wanting them to do and all of these other things feel like they are peripheral mm -hmm. and they're not they affect combat mm -hmm. and yeah. if, it, if it can be seen that way i think that that would would uh, make a difference, but I'm a civilian. I'm not, uh, you know, in the military, so I'm only seeing it from the outside. Um, but I, I uh, see that there is there is a big problem. And women, uh, I was looking at the numbers from this Military Times article and the uh, uh, government accounting report that was released in May of 2020, and they were focusing on 2014 to 2018. Mm -hmm. The Air Force is still the most diverse. They have 20.2% in 2018 for women. The Navy is uh, second with 19.6. The Army is 15.1 and the Marines are 8.6. Mm -hmm. So uh, they say that's less than 17% of the active duty military is made up of women. And that's a 1% increase since 2004. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's really remarkable that they're serving. Um, and, you know, we've touched on uh, uh, several of the different uh, issues that, that they are facing um, that are extraordinary. I, I would like to talk also about what is it like for women who are not serving, but they are serving in the sense that their family member, their husband, their fiance, their boyfriend, mm -hmm. their son, their whole life is changed when they are the female who is waiting for someone to come home. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd love for you to talk about that and that impact on, on them. So we're talking now from... Yeah you know, those that serve to those that are caring and loving those that serve and what kind of fallout that has when they come home and they're different. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, very much so. Uh, I just want to go back quickly to, to what we, you were just talking about, about sure, um, sure. sexual abuse. Um, the, there are statistics. I, I, I don't, I don't, couldn't put my finger on them right now, but mm -hmm. I have read statistics that there's a higher percentage of men with sexual abuse histories yeah. in the military than in the regular, in the general population. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. And I'm not sure if that's it, partly because some judges have said, you know, either jail or military. So they're, they're abusers, you're saying? Yeah. People who have a history of having- Of abusing. Of, abu of sexual abuse. There's a higher percentage of them in the military than in the in the general population, and I'm not what? sure why that is. Except, as I said, that there may be that some judges give them that option if they if they're facing uh, jail time. Um, Interesting. 
Yeah, it is interesting. Mm -hmm. right. And also manner, manner being, I mean. Of, of, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Of manner right. being sexually well, percent, assaulted. But, but yes. Yeah. Yeah. They are. And I've worked, we've worked with those too. Those as well. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Which is another whole set of issues. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, I'd love to talk to you about, about the family members. I, I ran a group. Oh, I was so blessed. I got this a grant to run a group uh, by telephone. It was started out weekly. And then after about three years, we went to every other week, but um, it lasted about four years, I think. And it was, sisters, mothers, um, uh, wives, I mean, all of the different women re that are related to, to, um, to veterans. And, um, oh my, uh, well, this is what I want to say. And I think that people don't realize this. And when I, I came, I taught a class a couple of years ago at Southern uh, Connecticut University and uh, on family members. And I broke it all down and it's just really amazing when you do it. But every, every piece of the whole military experience is a different set of issues for family members. Mm -hmm. So they either get drafted, which is what happened in Vietnam, but n nowadays they enlist. Well, right. there can be issues around that. Where did they discuss that with anybody? You know, mm -hmm. was there an agreement in the family that that was gonna be okay? You know, if, if it's a husband, did he consult his wife? I mean, sometimes husbands come back and say, guess what? I just, I decided, you know, yeah. I mean, they, maybe they had talked about it, but the final decision had not been discussed. Mm -hmm. um, or it's a son. A lot of times you have uh, mm -hmm. our daughter, but um, you know, you have, the, you have older children who enlist because they're 18 and then come home and say, guess what, mom and dad. So right. it depend, a lot depends on how, what that whole scenario was like, how people, everybody in the family is going to react to that. You know, the parents, the other siblings, everybody. So there's that piece. And then, of course, then there's, you know, when you have to go for, for training, boot camp. Right. So right. that's another milestone. And everybody, so that's a huge adjustment for the family, whether it's a, a parent or a child, mm -hmm. um, you know, and they go through all that. And everybody has feelings about it. But, you know, they're still inside. And they're still just in boot camp and everything's fine. But then they graduate mm -hmm. and there's, you know, being, being prepared to go abroad. Right. And um, so each stage, you know, then there's the deployment, mm -hmm. you know, and, and there's a, you know, well, we don't, they never tell you exact dates for security reasons mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because they don't want the enemy to know sure. when the shipments are coming. So the family members want, want to be there to send them off. But so, the, oh, we're leaving on the 25th. Okay. And they get a hotel room and they, and they get airline tickets and then, oh no, it's not going to be till the 30th. Right. So this is a huge disruption to families who are trying to be part of this process. Mm -hmm. And then, and then of course there's deployment and all of the issues that, that go on in, in deployment. And um, unlike other wars, we now have 24 hour capacity to contact one another. Right. And used to be, you know, you had somebody in a war zone you got a couple mm -hmm. of letters a year if you're lucky, right. you know. So um, this is a good thing on one hand, but it's mm -hmm. also very destructive on other on other levels. So um, it makes it much easier for the person at home to have access to the person in the war zone and maybe um, burdening them with problems from home, mm -hmm. which can be distracting for them in the war zone. Right. So that, right. that is an issue. You also have the issue of talking to a loved one and then hearing a bomb go off, yeah. you know, or right. he says, well, I got to go, we're being mom, you know, we're being, you know, murdered mm -hmm. or whatever. And, and then, you know, then the phone goes dead. And so that's very disturbing. Yeah. Or, you know, they call every Sunday evening and it's so nice to hear from them every Sunday evening. And tonight they didn't call. Right. Well, probably just out on a mission. They probably just right. couldn't but a right. family member doesn't know that. So there's always this heightened fear. Right, right. And, Just you know, like secondary trauma, isn't it? Is oh, absolutely. It's a, it's a form of trauma all on its own, you know? Right, and then, right. And then, you know, I think, I don't know. And that's the that. adults dealing, that's not the adults talking about dealing, the not even get, get down to the children. Oh my, it's my happening. Yeah. Yes. And why yeah. does daddy have to be away and you know, mm. all of that? Or, or you're a college student who's 
brother is serving and you're trying to concentrate on your studies, but the news is coming in that where he has been stationed is being overrun or whatever. I mean, though, it, it just goes, it just permeates everywhere. And I have to say too that, it, I don't know now, but I think roughly half or more of our troops are National Guard. Right. right. So they are not living on bases. Mm -hmm. They are living in their community. Right. And so, they're among us, these family members. They're the cashier at the grocery store, you know, right, the right. veterinarian. I mean, you don't know whose family mm -hmm. members are serving. And so they're, you know, maybe up late at night watching the news and then they have to get ready and go to work in the morning. And then of course, in families where a husband is away or, or the wife, but where one of the spouses is away and, and the other spouse has to handle everything, has to be parent, both parents right. and, and handle right. you know, all the responsibilities and, right. and things that the other partner used to do, they have to do. And then of course, they come home and mm -hmm. they're different. And you've been, the woman or man who's been home, the husband or wife has been managing everything. So you don't need me anymore. What do you need me for, you know, or mm -hmm. whatever. I mean, it's like right. everybody, everybody has grown and changed in the, in the yes. past that that person has been away and been traumatized in one way or mm -hmm. another. The children find a fu function in school. Right. You know, it, it's different on a base because all the kids in the school are all military kids. Yeah. And I think it's easy for them or easier. I'm just saying yeah. there's that, you know, but for kids in the community, a teacher may not even have any idea. Right. That your exactly. was deployed to whatever you know right so um that's you know that's another whole issue is the you know community and the community response and you know to their credit some some school districts or some um you know uh schools just schools um will have somebody who's kind of tuned into some of that and will try mm -hmm. to orient something so when they put that you know um uh you know, when there's a day when dad, daddy's supposed to bring you to school thing. Right, you know, right. Well, they can talk about that. Everybody has a daddy that can do that or, you know, whatever. So they try to be more sensitive mm -hmm. to the fact that some kids have parents who are deployed. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, but that's only if it's a community that has a large number of people serving. Right. And, and I think what's important, too, is that there may be different foundations or there may be different organizations or different... Um, groups that are supporting military families, they may be all over the place, but there are so many that are serving and there are so many families that when you, you know, exponentially, um, we, we, all, we need to step up, you know, yeah. as non-veterans, as, you know, just average citizens and saying, what can I do here to help this situation? You know, how can I, make uh, this more comfortable for their children or yeah. for, well, for this is why it's more important that the community is involved yes and so the, important yeah and the, the the best way we've done that so far was is to work through church communities yes yes you know, that's so we'll provide programs yeah you know, yes. whether it's a breakfast you know a free breakfast for homeless vets or uh mm -hmm. or discussion groups whatever it might be but but mm -hmm. they tend because they're already ready-made groups Yes, you know, and, yes. They, and they have a mission to care about other people. But, you know, it, in my dream, and if somebody wants to out there wants to help with this, that'd be great. But <laughs> if, if we could organize, if the community would organize in a way so that if there was somebody in your neighborhood, say, who, who was serving, well, then maybe mm -hmm. the guy next door would mow the lawn and the guy down the street would shovel and, mm -hmm. you know, and somebody else would bring a meal once in a while. Mm -hmm. or watch the children or whatever so mm -hmm. that there's a, a community network of support for military families yes and we don't we don't see so that great. yeah it would, be, it would be you know i mean why why not yeah or and i, I, things I, like I think a it's count for your oil change or yeah. you know what i mean yeah mm -hmm. yep. so it's but it's getting that word out and letting people know 
we're, we're all so isolated. I mean, particularly now because of COVID, well, yeah. but you know, unfortunately, but, but we don't, it's not like people used to sit out on their stoops, you know, back in the old days, I guess, and talk to each other and know their right. neighbors. And, 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 and that uh, unfortunately we're not like that. Mm -hmm. um, but we need to get back to that, <laughs> you know? I mean, I think well, yes, it's really uh, yes. missing. Missing is, it that, is it's a community. piece in our culture and why we're going mm -hmm. in the wrong direction sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I think it definitely makes it. You know, there's, there's a proverb that I just love, and it says, my enemy is one whose story I have not yet heard. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Yeah, you because know, when you sit face to face with someone, and you hear their story, and then you feel your own compassion, the connected humanness between us, much harder to, mm -hmm. to hate. That, that, you know, actually reminds me that, and I, I wish I could remember exactly where this is from, I'll find it and um, send it to you, but there was a program that was going on, I believe it was at public libraries, where they were having um, an area in which strangers would sit down and talk to each other and listen to each other oh, wow. as a just this practice. And I thought, oh, that I would love to do that at my library. But that same kind of thing where yeah. people will come in and sit down, complete strangers, and have 30 minutes to just say, who are you? And I'd like to get to know you. And, yeah. and um, just a sense of connection and caring. And I thought that was so beautiful. I, I hope that that will go you know, viral and all kinds right. of libraries will yeah. pick it up because yeah. um, that's the same kind of thing. If, if and maybe they would have a Veterans Day where they would come in and you would be able to sit across yeah. from someone yeah. and ask them about their service. Yeah. Or, yeah. And I, I think part of what I have learned um, from from the Veterans Summit too is that the the language is different that they have in the military. Um, things are defined, um, the, there are rules, and you come back and it's almost like being without a net anywhere. Suddenly it's this, you know, free for all. And I had this, um, one of the, one of the people that I interviewed, um, it was a, a former WAC, uh, retired WAC, uh -huh. um, and she, her name is Mary Cortani, and she um, trains, it, she did in the, in the service when she was in the army, she trained dogs for all different kinds of, of uh, missions and deployments yeah. and uh, a very skilled. Um, and when she got out, she um, has now done that and now has a nonprofit in which she will train the veteran to train their dog. And then the civilian will be also part of the process, but learning how to just talk to a veteran is yeah. not, you could trigger them by something that you don't even realize that you're saying. Um, and I'm, I'm learning that there are ways that, that things can be done, but one thing that I was so moved that she spoke about um, and that I had read about, I think it was also on her Facebook page, was in dealing with children, particularly, um, when they train the veteran for the dog, they find she matches, she's just, you know, oh, a savant yeah. at matching dogs for, you know, yeah, they're, yeah. They're, all, they're all rescue dogs, but she gets the yeah. right one for the right veteran. And yeah. they spend like 48 weeks, this is a long, intensive yeah. process, but what she said is that there was one of the veterans said that when he came home, he knew he was different and he had acted out, I guess, in his sleep. He may have hit his wife by mistake or some, something happened. And he said, can you help me help my daughter to understand that I don't mean to be like this and that I'm trying to get better? And uh, they ha always have a therapist available for this part too. And he said, no, Mary, I want you to do it with me and my daughter. And the little girl had been daddy's girl before she, he went off to war. And when he came back, 
he was a different person. And so she was a little afraid of him. And what was wonderful was the dog, Mary was letting the little girl know that the dog would watch for when dad was having a bad day. And so she could tell by looking at the dog. And the dog was a member of the family and the whole family was trained. But I thought, you know, isn't that beautiful? Because that's a real concrete resolution to a problem that a child has, that a child can understand. And by the way, these dogs are free, which is extraordinary. They are free to these veterans. And I'm thinking there's so much nuance to communicating with a veteran and they want to do it. And being able to come up with a variety of ways, and that's why I'm really passionate about what we're trying to do here, is say there are all these different alternatives. And it's not that one thing is the perfect thing, but this might be the thing that will help your wife or your husband or your child or your mother. You know, they're all different ways. Um, because the trauma of war is going to affect everybody and it's going to affect them all really differently. But I thought that that was so beautiful in the way for her to be feeling comforted that her dad didn't want to be this way, that somebody else was going to help her, help her dad, the dog, right. um, and that she could feel comfortable that that's how she would get a signal that, mm-hmm. that, uh, you know, he would be having a hard day. Isn't that beautiful? I and just also love to know that. That, that, that he's that he's trying. Absolutely. You know, yeah. and, that, that, yeah. and that the other grown ups are aware and they're gonna try to help her stay safe too. Yeah, it's that's yeah. that just beautiful. Job. Really, yeah. really beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I I think of of the women, uh, you know, the wives when the husbands come home and then they are having a hard time because they're not getting the kind of help that they need. Mm -hmm. I have heard so many repetitive complaints about getting over drugged and they don't want to be over drugged. And you know, that they are feeling like they are ghosts that they don't know how to come down, uh, not be hyper vigilant. Mm -hmm. And I just, my heart goes out to the wife and the mother of the children mm-hmm. trying to, to explain this to the children and also wanting their husband back, you know, after uh, however long they've yeah. been gone. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the husband is having so much difficulty. He wants to redeploy. I, I'm, I'm more okay. comfortable in yeah. combat than mm-hmm. I am at home. Mm-hmm. And I, I honestly don't sort of know how, how can you work that? I, I, I was saying to uh, uh, a friend that it's like you have to have almost two, two different buildings, you know, to handle the psychology mm-hmm. or the, I shouldn't say psychology, but the, the, the mental uh, effect of, what is going on when you go in and when you come out and when you're in between you're you're neither fish nor fowl and that they want you to go out and be prepared and be ready and able and you have to have a certain mindset in order to be able to do that Mm -hmm. and that's understandable but when you come home there's the, (laughs) the the huge desire is I want to get back. I want to get Hmm. back to who I was and I can't do that. And that frustration. And I was so, and have been so encouraged by the number of things that are available that help them to do that Hmm. and really wanted to tell them. I mean, everything from, having, you know, a canine um, service dog or having uh, equine therapy or going on to do something with a sweat lodge or, I mean, there's so many things that are maybe not available at the VA, but that's all right. They work. 
just if you know about them, that's the most important thing is whatever fits, whatever works for now, yeah. but it's not going to be self-medication and all and, and being drugged so that you don't remember. Yeah. You want to really be able to have lasting healing. And that comes in multitude of ways. And you've seen that in the retreats that you've done, which have been so profound. And if you could speak about that, because I think that that reconciliation and the responsibility that you were talking about, that we as, as um, you know, those who have sent them need to take on, I think that's a really important component that people aren't so aware of that I'd love you to speak about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is, it is actually very profound. And I think of the other thing that often gets mixed. Uh, we, we, I, we've been talking more and more about moral injury. Yes. And that's a good thing. Yes. Um, but I think we really need as a culture to, uh, to be more aware of it and to address it uh, head on. But um, when veterans are coming home hoping to be their old self, they soon, nothing seems normal to them right. when they get back, you know. Mm -hmm. So the adjustment is just so hard. And then, you know, they can compound the issues by maybe some domestic abuse, maybe some alcohol or drug abuse. And that just compounds them. Maybe there's a legal thing going on, you know. Or, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it just, you know, goes from down, down, down. So mm -hmm. um, what one of the things we really talk about in our retreats is, the impulse, especially with today's vets who are, who are enlisting, they're not being drafted. You know, what was your impulse? You wanted to be a warrior. You wanted to be part of something bigger than yourself, you know, mm -hmm. and you know, you didn't know what it was really all about, but you wanted to serve your country, whatever. And, and um, so we're going to use that, that impulse that you have as a warrior, as a spiritual warrior. Mm -hmm. How are you going to, how are you going to live that out now? It's right. not like you ended your service in the military. Right. And so now you're done with your mission because mm -hmm. your mission was to be more than, than you were. And now you're coming home and you're feeling empty. So what we need to do is to find that warrior spirit that's going to take you through the rest of your life. Right. And going to help you be directed. And that's those same impulses to, you know, to protect and defend, which are the original, you know, it's not about, mm -hmm. Killing. I mean, killing is right. a big part of that, but sure. the impulse is to protect. And right, protect. right. And we, you can do that everywhere. You can do that at home. You can do that with your children. You can do that, mm -hmm. you know, in, at schools. You can do that, you know, through sports. I mean, there's a million ways that you can be a leader and, and help your community uh, in, in meaningful ways so that your service doesn't have to be the only meaningful thing you've done. But um, so we work a lot on finding the inner warrior, the inner spiritual warrior right. and and taking the things that have happened in the in the war zone or military, but not just the war zone, but in the military in general and and saying this is was part of my life. Now I have to mm -hmm. grow my soul, my spirit bigger than that mm -hmm. because it's it, so that it's not my whole life. Right. And so we help people create, you know, those kinds of goals. And, and it's really amazing, you know, because we also don't pathologize what they're going through. That's and we right. tell them that right up front. That's so Not because good. there's something wrong with you. No. You're responding the way a human being responds under these horrible conditions. Absolutely. You yes. have to take that stigma away. That, Absolutely. You know, yes. None of us can go through what you went through and not be impacted. And so, yeah. Right. You know, yeah. and so we take right. that stigma right away and we don't even and we uh, sometimes we we, uh, we even try not to use the term PTSD. Right. Because it implies it's, it's a disorder and it's not a disorder. It's a normal response. It's an injury. So start there. It's an injury that occurred. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. right. Just yeah. like a broken arm or anything else, you know, yeah. you yeah. have to heal the injury. That's right. That's right. So and, you know, and traumatic brain injury is such a huge issue, too. And I think a lot of people who are suffering aren't even tested for that. Mm -hmm. you know? We have a great 
we have a great person talking about that actually. Oh, good. Oh, good. good. Yes, yes, well, yes. Who's who has studied and come up with with a fantastic uh, therapy for that, okay. um, Andrew Marr. So um, yeah. that'll be part of what we're talking about. Yeah. Good. Yep. Good. Yep. So. Um, yeah, so we try to normalize their experience. And then, as we, mm -hmm. I said, we, while we talk about the experiences they had in war being like rocks in their rucksack. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, we're there, the rest of the community that's non-veteran, civilian, is there to help lighten that load mm -hmm. by letting them take those rocks out one at a time, tell us what it represents, what story, what event, you know, and so that we as a, as a community can share it and hold it and carry it. Now, if this is your story, you've told me, now I'm carrying that story too. Mm -hmm. And I hold it sacred. And it, you know, mm -hmm. When veterans share yeah. oh. their deep stories, I can tell you that is really a sacred event. It is. Uh, and precious, you know. Mm -hmm. So we, we, exp you know, we express that that way. And, and then we do ritual around, you know, after they've told their stories to, to confer the responsibility it was your you did it in, in the name of our government in the name of our you know my nation and that makes me you know you did it in for us and so mm -hmm. i'm going to help you carry that and so we do a lot around that we um we have them take vows at the end that imply where they're going to where they're moving to we mm -hmm. do that with a little bit of a uh, creative activity that we do mm -hmm. that kind of uh visualizes it um but uh, the process is, it's a ritual from the beginning to the end, first of all. Mm -hmm. It's based on Native American models yeah. of homecoming. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly what they did after not just, not a year downrange, but after one battle, you know, right. they come home and the whole community would be there and they would all listen to the stories. And then they might act, they, you know, when we see... Um, and in the movies, we see, um, you know, the war paint and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. some of that is to just work themselves up in the beginning. But at the end, they'll do dances. That, that they'll make up a dance that depicts what happened in the battle. Or they'll, mm -hmm. you know, you see teepees with paintings on them. A lot of those mm -hmm. are about what happened in the battle. You know, yeah. and so the, it becomes part of the lore of mm -hmm. the tribe. And your story and your story, everybody's story becomes part of the tribe's story. And so that's what we try to reproduce in a sense in, in the retreats. And, you know, the guys walk in and on Friday night or Thursday night and they've got their caps down here. You know, they don't take their hats off. They got their sunglasses on still, even though it's nine o'clock at night, you know, and, um, <laughs> You know, the next day, maybe, you know, the sunglasses come off, but the hat's still down here, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and then by Sunday, you know, by Sunday, the hat's gone, the glasses are gone, and, you know, uh, they're, they're really yeah. much more animated and involved. And, yeah, a lot of them start out by thinking, oh, what's this going to be about? You know? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, well, I, I think there's a, there, I, I can understand that there's almost this immediate distrust of you know what do you want and you know what are you going to dig up and and right. um you know i i think that that's so important to feel like you know not <laughs> if somebody has had a bad experience with a therapist uh, you know i i was talking to a, a um a doctor the other day and she said that 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 their plan was um i'm gonna see you and never come back that's my plan. I'm just showing up and then I'm not coming back. Wow. And, um, you know, she did some remarkable things when she was first in her practice at the VA. Um, she's no longer, you know, at, at the VA, but has uh, just done some incredible work. And one of the things that they started was a, a partnership with a peer so that wow. their practice was... In, in tandem so that the peer who's already gone through the military knows exactly what the other person is dealing with and the new guy the therapist mm -hmm. <laughs> you know that that if this person approves of this person and if they can see how these two people work together that there is immediately sort of this dropping of that defense because they have someone they trust there who they know knows and gets it. And that person is sort of handed the torch. And she said that they would um, split sometimes, you know, she would spend some time 
with uh, the patient doing her therapy. The peer would spend time with the patient, working things through. They'd go out on hikes together. <laughs> She'd say, can I come with you on the hike? <laughs> you know? But it was that same sense of really getting getting the whole hierarchy, the power, the, you know, I know it all, that was gone. It was just this neutral zone of I'm here for you Mm -hmm. to help listen your speed. We're not going to go diving in, but often their experience because that, you know, the ones that are getting them ready to deploy have their checklist and then the ones that are coming home have their checklist. Yeah. And the checklist itself is triggering oh, you know, to, to be able to go through all of that. So uh, her approach was just uh, so much more of a sensitivity, which is clearly what you and Dr. Tick have done as well, is to be able to really reach the heart, the yeah. soul, the part that really needs to be heard and you hear it even before they say it. And that's the part that is so critical is to be able to do that. And I'm finding that as I'm researching this um, through the books that I have and will make available to everybody, there's so much that they can learn mm-hmm. uh, and understand how the behavior when you say this or say that, or what you could do to be helpful, to really understand what we can do to help and to genuinely care for these people who are so extraordinary in their selflessness to give their lives for our country. I mean, it is, Mm -hmm. it's just really amazing when you think about it, that people would do that. You know, it's just astonishing. Mm -hmm. And particularly the way our culture is right now, they need to be even more revered, uh, I think, for for that love of this country and willingness to serve. Um, so where we, I have to let you get back to your, your life. I could <laughs> worse talking to you, uh, but, um, if there would be one thing, um, Kate, that you would say that you really want to share to, let's say a veteran is listening to this one night in the, you know, the library section or the website or whatever, where all these will be housed to be able to say, you know, I just don't know if I can go on. And then they listen to this. Can you give them some sense of why they will be able to go on from your experience? Because it's possible to accept our destiny. It's possible to be able to say, these things happened. I can't go back and change them. All I can do is find the best response for my own life and to, and to continue on my path of growth and, and healing. Um, there is such a thing as post-traumatic growth. Yes, yes. And, and they need to know that. Yes, and, yeah. and um, I remember one of the people in one of the groups, you, you asked him to explain the warrior path. Can you explain that a little bit too? Because I think that's the same. Yeah, right? yeah. Well, I, of course, it comes from our Native American brothers and sisters, but the notion is that, that the warrior really protects the tribe. And that can take many, many forms. It doesn't mean just going to war. It can be changing laws and, you know, or volunteering for organizations and things like that. It's, it's a, it's a way of life. Right. And as warriors, you're trained to deal with danger. You're trained to be uh, on guard. And so many of our veterans, of course, become police officers or uh, first responders responders of all sorts. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, you know, that's, which is, Beautiful, and it makes sense because they've taken what they've learned, and they're and they're now they're applying it differently, and 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 that's you know that's one of the recipes. Um, so being but having that warrior spirit is, is about that, and it's not about killing, it's not about violence, it's about mm-hmm. stopping violence, 
Right. And, and so uh, it might mean going into an inner city and talking with some youth that are, you know, on the edge of getting into legal trouble, you mm -hmm. know, um, working with um, after school programs and things like that to help mm -hmm. kids that are at risk for, you know, in, in, in neighborhoods where they may very well get wrapped up in crime and so on to give them a path. Mm -hmm. you know, we all, we all want a path. We all want a purpose, mm -hmm. you know, and when we can't find one that's constructive, we often turn to destructive things or we do destructive things to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's really about finding a constructive, uh, life path that you can right. you, you can move on and you know that may be it may be religious you may have you know that may be part of your religion it mm -hmm. may not it may just be a, a spiritual thing that you you know that you carry with you right. in a very special way but you know that you are capable you're a, you, you've been trained to to right. care for others and to protect them and so how are you going to use that now how are you going to take that out into the mm -hmm. world and maybe it means you're going to be a you know, a first responder for people who get lost in the mountains or, mm -hmm. you know, all those kinds of things. Right. Um, or maybe you'll have a, you'll have a, you know, a day job and then you do these things, you know, af after, after hours. So uh, it's certainly possible to continue being a warrior and having that warrior spirit. And, you know, there are, you don't have to have gone through the military to be a warrior, a spiritual warrior. Yeah. Right? That's, that's important too. You know, I mean, Gandhi. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Right. Martin yes. Luther King. You know. So yes. we came, You know, yes. a lot of people that we know that you know that, that embody that that spirit mm -hmm. of um, doing what's right and standing up what's for right and defending those who can't defend themselves. Mm. The mission goes on for sure. <laughs> That's. You know, I think. I think when when people participate in a lot of destruction, mm -hmm. they need to do things that are creative. Yes. Kind of act that. And that, and that might be community building. It might be, you know, uh, coaching Little League, but it, but it also might be woodworking or it might be painting or it might be writing. Or yeah, acting, story, you know, storytelling. All, all, all the arts. Yeah, Dancing. all the That's, arts. Yeah, you know, All the arts are a wonderful way to... Theater, yeah. yeah. There's so many innovative things. There are actors who will pair up with a veteran, hear mm -hmm. the story and they discuss it and discuss it. And then the actor acts Yes, out. yes. Okay, and you can see your story being presented. I mean, or art shows that are all, um, you know, mm -hmm. by veterans. Mm -hmm. or, and music. Oh, my gosh, the music that's being produced now by our vets and our veterans is incredible. So there are a lot of those outlets. And a lot of ways. are really, really important. Yep. Right, right. Now, did you ever hear of combat papers that came out of the Iraq vets? They were taking no. their uniforms and turning them into paper. I'm no kidding. Wow. Right. And then they were doing, using them for artwork or for writing things. I mean. Wow. Isn't yeah. that fantastic? Yeah. So it's, it's, beautiful. it's important for that, for, for people who come out of the military to know that there's all kinds of options. There's and, a lot still. And that there, that there, are, yeah. there are people, mm -hmm. civilians, who want to understand. That's right. That's helps. great. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Kate. What a pleasure. What a joy. I loved every minute of this. Oh, and uh, I look forward to seeing you again soon. Yes. Uh, yes. To continue, to continue the discussion, continue the work. Yeah, so thank, thank you, you. Also so much, Jane, for, uh, for doing this, this project. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, blessings to you and Dr. Yes, Tick. And uh, I will see you soon. Okay. Thank you so okay. much, Kate. Glad we got to do this finally. <laughs> Thank you. Me too. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay.